I'm Mike, thank you. And Happy New Year to you. And a warm welcome to everyone, whatever time of the year it is, to Broken Bread, where we're studying, in fact, coming to the last study in this series that had the subtitle of To the Churches of Galatia. That was a reminder, initially, to the fact that this wasn't written to a church in Galatia. This was written to several churches in Galatia. Paul addresses as the churches. So, the last time we were together, we were looking at Galatians study 39, and we began to talk about bearing one another's burdens. And we took our cue from Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, where it says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the Lord of Christ. And I think that in what remains of most of this chapter, we'll actually be looking at aspects of the Lord of Christ, which is really to love one another, to serve one another in love, to express that agape love which we've defined as the love that chooses not to seek its own. It always puts the interests of others first. So we began to have a look at this statement, and uh, we looked to begin with at what I call three scenarios of remedial discipline. And if you remember, we looked at that Matthew passage in Matthew 18, where the Lord in detail gave to the disciples the process whereby a straying sheep, as a result of some contention, some confrontation maybe, had gone off on his own and become separated from the flock. And the steps that are taken, the steps that are listed here, as to the way of seeking to redeem that one, bring him back into the family of God. This is pastoral care in principle, and we're coming to the second part now, which was, watch your step. This is coming from those same verses, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, and we've said before that we have effectively a definition of what Paul means by spiritual from earlier on in this letter, where he has spoken of the fruit of the Spirit and contrasted it with the works of the flesh, and said effectively that each one shows the true nature and the true disposition by what it manifests. The works of the flesh are manifest. They they're obvious, they shine out, there's no doubt as to what they are. And of course, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and Jesus said, it's by your fruit that you will be known. So this really is that expression of the love of God expressed to others, and we just began to look at those things. Okay, restore such a one, he says. And we made mention of the fact that this is a, a word, a verb, which actually means to put things right again, to restore them. It's used of the mending of the nets that the disciples were doing when Jesus called them from their nets. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful picture, really, of seeking someone in order to get him back on track, back on the flight path, in order to win him, to use the language of Matthew chapter 18, and to bring him back. And Paul says here that there are essential qualifications for the man or the woman who engages on this particular exercise, and they have to be a spiritual man or a woman. Only they are qualified for this errand of mercy. The fruit of the Spirit will be manifest in this person and in their disposition and behavior in the way that they seek to mend, to repair such a one. Those who walk according to the flesh and whose lives show their disposition, they are disqualified automatically from 
this particular exercise. So, in the spirit of gentleness, lest you also be tempted. And that brings us into this other sense that we're coming to, where we're having to think about ourselves as well. Lest you also be tempted. It's interesting how frequently uh, the Lord, this is Paul, for example, speaking to the elders from the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, when he says, Take heed to yourselves and to the church of God. First, he says, Look to your own pattern of life, your own disposition. Look to yourselves. And famously, of course, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he gave him his counsel and advice and said that in doing these things, he would save not only himself, but those who heard him. So, really, we have to be aware of God's continuing discipline in our lives, of God truing up the direction of our lives or sharpening the way in which we exercise our care for other people, and at the same time, always being mindful that we do it, in a sense, from the side of a brother, not from the top. This, If you want a picture to this, this winning such a one, this bringing him back such a one, is not two people standing face to face, and one prodding the other one with his forefinger in the chest and saying, you should do this, you must do this. It's much more the picture of two men walking side by side, or two women for that matter, one with the arm around the other's shoulders, just encouraging them on and gently leading them back into the way that they need to go. And it may look, when you look at this passage, that there's a contradiction here, because in the older versions it, it says, uh, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the Lord of Christ. And then later on it says, bear your own burdens. But actually, the, the word is slightly different. And in the second case, it means more, almost more a sense of a commission, a load, the way in which you would load a ship. You would give it, you would commission and send it on its way. And, and here, when that happens, of course, before God, we bear our own burdens. We, we, we look to God himself to make those things kind of work out in the way that they ought to. And in Galatians chapter 6, verses 3 to 5, he says, uh, For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. There's that word, deceive. Don't be deceived. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own lading, his own burden, that that God has Put upon his shoulder. And then we talked about carrying through pastoral care and practice, following through. And we came back to this familiar question of ours context, context, context. To whom is Paul writing? Well, he's writing to people who have had an authentic, clear conviction, a clear event in which the Spirit came into their lives. You see this from earlier on in Galatians when he says, asks the question and says, when you receive the Spirit, etc., etc., and the one who works amongst you, the miracles, does he do it by? So he's obviously addressing people who began in the Spirit and people who are continuing in the Spirit. When Paul writes to the Corinthians, of course, he says this, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given you by Christ Jesus. And then you see he affirms their, the reality of their beginnings in Christ. And then he moves on a little bit farther into the first chapter of Corinthians, and he says, It's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions amongst you. And we observe the fact that contentions were part of that um, disposition displayed in the works of the flesh. He says, Now this I say, that each one of you says, I. I sometimes think that that could almost be a title for the letter to the Galatians. Each one of you says, I. 
That was what was wrong with the church in Corinth. Not its beginnings, not what had happened in its early days. What had happened is that something had gone wrong. They had begun to be self-centered, egotistical. And that's a sure sign of the flesh at work. Okay, while well, he was writing because of this walking in the flesh-ness, the, the, this is where the, you move from the verb to the noun in the English and almost lose all sense of connect, connection because this, the word flesh is built into the word carnality in the, in the Greek, and we, we can't see that quite so clearly in our English versions. And then, of course, this condition of the man who is in a relationship, an immoral relationship, this has become the pattern of his life. And Paul points out two failures, not only the failure of the man, but also the failure of the church, because the church had not responded to this man's walk in any way at all, apparently. That's that's how it seems. And then you have this time when Paul speaks about handing over this man with a view to keeping the church pure. So let's have a look then at the taking of our responsibility for ourselves. This is Paul. We've just read this passage. He needs to bear his own load. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But if each one, let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. The modern versions tend to kind of put a different word there to distinguish from the word burden earlier on in the chapter. So he's talking here about carrying something, bearing his own load, his own burden. And that reminded me of a passage of Scripture which is so well known. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians again, in 1 Corinthians and chapter 13. And when he's described love in action, when he's described agape in the way it manifests itself, the love that seeks not its own is one of the things he describes love as. And then he says this in 1 Corinthians 30 and verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Very, very familiar passage of Scripture. But I, I want you to know something. I want you to notice something. How Paul repeats the word I in here consistently all the way through. I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now here's my question, and you'll see it very obviously if you've got 1 Corinthians 13 verse 11 in front of you. Who put away childish things? Answer, Paul put away childish things. One of the signs of maturity is when a man or a woman begins to take personal responsibility for their lives. They, they stop blaming their parents or their older brother or circumstances or anything, but they take responsibility for their lives. They grow up. And this is what Paul is admonishing the Corinthians, that they need, they, they need to move on in God and to grow up. And part of that is making choices and taking personal responsibility for the state of our lives. Now, we know it's all by grace through faith, but God will hold us accountable for that that he has revealed to us, for the grace that is made available to us. And Paul says here, when I became a man, I made changes. It, it's not enough to say the trouble with our churches or the trouble with my relationship with my wife or with my husband is, or somebody else is blocking me from doing what I really ought to be doing. When I become a, when you take responsibility, when you become a man, when you grow up in Christ, you put away childish things. You make the choices to put away the things that more appropriately belong to childhood. 
And Paul has this to say as well. He says, I put away. And it's uh, it's one of Paul's favorite words. Uh, it's one of my favorite words too. It's the Greek word katargeo, which is used 27 times in the New Testament and 25 times by Paul. It's the verb that's used when it says that our old man was crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be, and the King James says destroyed, and other versions say annulled or made powerless or ineffective. And that's it. And what Paul here says is, when I became a man, I brought things that I was doing to an end so that they no longer had any power. Katargeo means to leave something idle, unoccupied, to make it of no effect, to nullify it. We have to do that. And it's interesting that Paul uses the perfect tense. And the perfect tense has this significance, that it begins in the past and continues to the present. In other words, you might say, if you wanted to, Paul says, I put away and it stayed put away. This isn't just an event. This is an event, the effects of which are carrying through into the present. Personal responsibility, then. Responsibility. And then we come into this part here, which we didn't get to last time. And he says, it's in this same section, in the middle of this chapter 6, and referring to bearing one another's burden and being together in this fellowship of pressing on in the things of God, he then says this, and it, it, you might almost think, well, where does this come from? He says this, he says, Let him who is taught in the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Now, the preachers down the ages have struggled with this verse, mainly because they usually receive their support from the saints of God, and they don't want to put wrong burdens on people, and they don't want to rattle the collection plate saying, I need some funds from you. Paul never rattled the collection, the collection plate but he was always mindful of the way in which God had used other people to support him and consequently to enable him in the job that God had given him to do. And I think our American brothers are much better at doing this than uh, the English uh, part of the family. Uh, we get a little bit pink around the ears at the talk of um, personal finances and the leaders and that kind of thing. But Paul says here, let him who is taught in the word share in all things with him who teaches. And the word share is a great word because this is the word that really comes from koinon, koinonia, which is fellowship. So let's put that in there, shall we? Let him who is taught the word fellowship in all good things with him who teaches. You see, there is this mutuality. There is this fellowship, God giving grace to one that another might be blessed by it. And and it, it, it's this togetherness, and it's this giving and receiving that often links people together in a, in a way that, that nothing else does. And sometimes you get a situation in churches where as they grow in numbers and sometimes grow more prosperous, it's easy for them to become more self-sufficient. And when they become more self-sufficient, they usually do less sharing because the needs aren't there. If we dig a little bit deeper, we kind of find different translations for this. I did this earlier on this week, and um, I was amused to see a sort of um, a sort of a sequence. Here you are. Just listen to this: how the word gets stronger as you go through. This is. The New King James Version. Let him who is taught, this is almost like an invitation, let him who has taught the word share in all good things 
with him who teacheth. That's a nice. That would suit the English people in the congregation, without a doubt. Then he comes on a little bit stronger in the New American Standard Bible. Uh, the one who is taught in the Word is to share. This is kind of um, a strong recommendation now. The one who is taught in the Word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. And if you go to the New International Version, it becomes a moral obligation. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the Word should share all good things with their instructor. And in fact, in the original, this is in the imperative form, which means this is a direct command. And the, the NET Bible, which is more of a translation and more of a paraphrase in the actual text, but its notes are very, very useful very often. They have this. Now the one who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with the one who teaches it. That's not an invitation. It's not a strong recommendation. It's not a moral obligation. It's a direct command by the Spirit of God speaking through the pen of Paul. And then he goes on to say this. He talks about sowing. Don't be deceived, he says, for God isn't mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he'll also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And then here's another S for you. Share, sow, and then stick at it. In the church where I was converted, it was an Anglican church, and we had a, a, a dear old saint who was in her late 70s, which was very old in those days. She was a retired infants teacher. She was a Scot, a MacDonald, and um, she was often telling us that although she was in the Anglican Church where we were because it was evangelical that actually she was a Presbyterian and she was very very kind of conscious about her Presbyterianism and um, she often used to say things like um, you know you can get a letter from one part of the country to the other part of the country as long as you get something which will just stick on it she said and she said, you young people, if you'll just stick at it, God will take you through and make you useful to others. She was a, an absolute gem. She would walk a good mile um, to the morning meetings, well into her 70s, maybe into her 80s, always at the prayer meetings, always at the early morning prayer meeting. Yeah, <laughs> happy memories. So stick at it. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season, not immediately necessarily, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Keep at it. You see, we, we're not working for an instant event. We are sowing. We are sowing and knowing that God, in the fullness of time and in due season, and his time, will bring things to fruitfulness. And we shall reap if we don't lose heart. Then it says this, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Notice that, as we have opportunity. God will give us opportunity, and we need to pray that God will give us the heart which is quick to recognize an opportunity for what it is and to take the opportunity to, to do good to the people in the meeting that you go to? Well, yes, but let us do good to all. That neighbor of yours, that, that work colleague, that person that uh, parks his car in your space, what a thing, how dare he. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. You see, in the Old Covenant, a covenant, it was clear, and God made this abundantly clear to them in so many different ways, that the fact that the people of Israel began to bite and devour one another, to use Paul's language, 
because they were set to enhance their own wealth and comfort at the expense of others, they ground the poor um, into the dust and sold them for the price of a pair of shoes. God accused them of at one occasion. But underlying the prophetic word was this idea that when the horizontal relationship breaks down in this covenant into which God has brought us, it's a sure sign that the vertical relationship is broken. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. To those who are in this same covenant, we have a covenant obligation. Now there is a word for that that is sometimes obscured in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and it's a, it's a lovely word. It's the word that's translated sometimes tender mercies, sometimes steadfast mercies, sometimes just mercies. It's actually the Hebrew word chesed, which really means faithful love, covenant faithfulness. That's what it means. Well, God has brought us by grace by that beginning that was in the Spirit, into a covenant not only with himself, but with others who are in the same covenant, who are of the household of faith. And here Paul, in this whole section about bearing one another's burdens and so fulfilling the, the law of Christ, goes on to say, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And then we come unto Galatians chapter 6 and verse 11 and 12, and he says, See with what large letters I've written to you in my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. And then you have what might be used as a summary of the whole letter of the Galatians. And he says this, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. It's nothing to do with our genes or our background. It has to do with that infusion of new life, which is creation. We don't advance it by keeping laws. Uncircumcision is nothing. That's no better position either than circumcision. They avail nothing. They add nothing to the journey. They add nothing to the work that God is doing in their hearts. The only thing that changes everything is a new creation. That's why I think two or three times now in the course of these studies, I've used this little phrase and said that the new covenant is a paradigm shift. It changes everything. And then you have this prayer from Paul. And as many as walk according to this rule, do you remember we talked about walking where Paul says, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. And I said that that word walk is not the ordinary just going about our day's business, peripatio walk, but as another walk, stoikeo, which really means to walk in a straight line, and the, or, if you like, almost marching in step, keeping in step. So he says, as many as walk according to this rule, I'm pretty sure that's the Greek word canon, which actually means a, a rule, a straight line. And then he says to them, peace and mercy. Now oh, he's an interesting. Because whenever, almost, in my observation anyway, whenever the New Testament 
quotes from the Old Testament and uses the word mercy. The New Testament word mercy is being used to translate the old Hebrew word chesed, which means more than just being kind to people. It's more than just patting them on the head or consoling them. It's the kind of chesed that David spoke of when he said, I want to show the chesed of God to those who are of Jonathan's seed. Covenant faithfulness. As many as walk according to this rule, peace, shalom, that would have been in Hebrew, that's wholeness, completeness. Shalom and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Then we have this question. What does he mean by the Israel of God? And I'm not going to go into a, a, a dispute or a long explanation. I'm just going to tell you what the options are. and Maybe you can think of some more and then tell you what my conclusion is. What does Paul mean by the Israel of God? Is he talking here about two different groups? Those who are walking to this rule, that's to say those who are walking in the life and the power of a new covenant and not depending upon self-righteousness to acquire acceptance with God. And then is he adding another group to that, which is the Israel of God? Or is this one way of, like what they call a Hebrew parallelism, almost saying the same thing but adding just a different nuance to it? As many as walk according to this rule, peace be upon them and upon the Israel of God. It could be national Israel. It could be genetic Israel. It could be believing Israel. It could be those who have the genes and the faith of Israel. I think he's referring to the new covenant saints. Those who are in Christ from Israel and from the Gentiles, wherever they started their journey, they had a brand new beginning in the Spirit. And to them, as they walk according to this rule, not just living, being alive in the Spirit, but taking step-by-step step purposed choices day by day. So he prays peace and covenant mercy and upon the Israel of God. There's a phrase in the Old Testament, the Lord God of Israel. And it, if you have it like that, it just sounds like a title, the Lord God of Israel. Now, titles are important and all God's titles are revelations of his character. But if you just say it like that, you miss something which is key, and that is that the word Lord in that little phrase, and that phrase is used many, many times in the Old Testament. In fact, Jehovah, God of Israel, or the Lord, our God, that's to say Jehovah, our God, is used more than 400 times in the Old Testament, in the American Standard Version. The title of Jehovah is now lost to all modern translations. And we miss this truth, that Jehovah was Israel's God. He wasn't just the God, he was their God by promise and covenant. He had committed himself to them and they to him. They were his and he was theirs. This is Jehovah, Israel's God. Now, by a new covenant, a different people with a different origin have come into existence as God's people, God's Israel. Not just Israel's God, but God's Israel those who are his, who are no longer their own. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. 
And then a final testimony. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. I guess he had a few wounds and scars, and maybe there's a reference here to them. But the marks that branded him as the servant of Jesus Christ were deeper down than bruises in his flesh. He was scarred permanently in his inner man. And a cross had done it that he had chosen for the sake of the one who had loved him and given himself for him. Okay, we'll end our studies there. Thank you for sharing with us in this journey. And I do hope you'll come back next week because we've got something else in store. Coming soon to a screen near you. We have a new Broken Bread series starting on Thursday, the 7th of January, 2021. God willing, we begin a new series for our Broken Bread studies entitled The Better Covenant, A Study Guide. Now, this was a suggestion from uh, my, my brother Robert Woods at initially, but it chimed immediately with something that I'd wanted to do for a long time. And uh, Mike Coles, too, was keen that we should do this. So there will be a series of studies based on my book that I wrote nine years ago called The Better Covenant. And in fact, when we've sorted this out in the next couple of days or so, new purchasers will be able to get the current version of that book at a discounted price, which will last for a month. The purchasers, incidentally, of the printed copy of The Better Covenant already get a free Kindle version, and that will continue with the discounted price. So we're trying to make this a real online Bible school experience project with lots of ongoing support to encourage those following the course. More details will follow. and Please do visit uh, www.biblebase.com for the latest details which we'll put in the announcements section and your comments will be warmly welcome as will your prayers. Please do pray for us as we try to get this course up and running and make it a pray that God will make it a blessing to the saints of God. And whatever time of the year it is, Happy New Year and God bless you and thank you for spending this time with us. Bye-bye.